Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. My name is Andy Cahan, Director of Author Events, and I'm pleased to introduce our presenters. As I'm sure many of you would agree, across the political spectrum and throughout our history, the public has demanded the suppression of ideas and images that allegedly threaten our nation. However, as our guests argue, the biggest danger comes not from speech, but from censorship. In their new book, Free Speech and Why You Should Give a Damn, Jonathan Zimmerman and Signe Wilkinson chart the history of free speech in the US and argue for its renewed importance amidst contemporary challenges to the First Amendment. Jonathan Zimmerman is the Judy and Howard Berkowitz Professor in Education at the University of Pennsylvania and a leading scholar on the ways in which schools and universities address controversial topics such as free speech, sex, and religion. Signe Wilkinson is a widely syndicated cartoonist and the first woman to win the Pulitzer Prize for editorial cartooning. Formerly based at the Philadelphia Daily News and the Philadelphia Inquirer, she is the recipient of four Overseas Press Club Awards and two Robert F. Kennedy Journalism Awards for cartooning. Tonight, the conversation will be led by Robert Mankoff, a cartoonist and former cartoon editor of The New Yorker and now cartoon and humor editor for Esquire and not an infrequent guest at the Free Library. It's great to have you here with us tonight. The screen is yours. Well, I guess I'll, since I am the impresario here and I'm gonna move it ahead, I'm just gonna say I'm delighted to be here with Signe, who I've known for many years, is a fantastic cartoonist, and uh, John Timmerman, who I, who I just met today, and uh, may well be a fantastic cartoonist, but I know both of them have created a fantastic book about free speech and why you should give a damn. So we're gonna have a sort of free flowing conversation, but I'm gonna turn it over to John now to uh, start to talk about why we should give a damn about free speech. Uh, thank you. Well, thanks to Andy Cahan and the Free Library for sponsoring all this and to, and to Bob Benkoff, the cartooning legend, uh, for joining us tonight. And speaking of cartooning legends, uh, just on the most personal level, I just want to give a huge thank you to Signe Wilkinson. Um, like anybody that contributes to or consumes Philadelphia media, I think I was a, I've been a huge fanboy of her work for three decades, but I never met her until about two years ago. She emailed me and said, you want to have coffee? And I said, sure. And we sat down and she said, so I've got this idea for a book um, and I want you to write it and I'll illustrate it. Um, uh, and that's what we did. Uh, but I think the drawings, her drawings really are the story of the book. Um, she's able to capture ideas in a way that my words don't or can't. And uh, working with her on this has been one of the real highlights uh, of my career. Um, so that's the story of the book. But the story in the book, that is the first story in the book, is about Mary Beth Tinker, which is a name that some of you might uh, uh, have heard of. She's the kid who, at age 13, wore the black armband to her middle school in protest of America's involvement of the Vietnam War. She was sent home, and eventually that became the case Tinker v. Des Moines, where the Supreme Court upheld her right, indeed, students' rights to protest. Well, um, I've become friends with Mary Beth Tinker over the years. Um, uh, she's just a fabulous tribune for free speech. And she came to my class at Penn a couple of years ago and she did her shtick about this subject. And then the Q&A started and the students said, look, Ms. Tinker, you were fighting the good fight. You were fighting the war in Vietnam. This Milo Yiannopoulos clown, you know, this Ann Coulter jokester, like all they do is hurt people. And Mary Beth in her very gentle way was not having it. She said, look, at Warren Harding Middle School, when I was 13, there were kids there who had dads and brothers who were fighting and dying in Southeast Asia. Do you think they weren't hurt by this like snot-nosed kid wearing this symbol saying that their loved one was dying for a lie? You don't think that hurt them? Like, <laughs> then you're not thinking. Like, of course it hurt them. Um, words do hurt, words that matter. Um, but if that's going to be your rubric, if that's going to be your barometer, well, you're not going to allow Mary Beth to speak or to symbolize either. Uh, and then, you know, the students said, well, look, this whole free speech thing, isn't this just an abstraction? I mean, all of this is just about power, right? Who wields it? Who doesn't? And people with power get to speak and people without it don't. Um, 
And Mary Beth wasn't having that either. She said, look, at this moment in 1965, I was a 13 year old kid. Speech was the only power that I had. And indeed speech has been across our entire history, often the only weapon of the powerless. And Bob, if you could put up the first cartoon, which is a brilliant one by, by Sidney Wilkinson. Um, for me, you know, this, this drawing really captures both of those themes. Um, Martin Luther King Jr. himself was an absolutist about free speech. That is an absolute advocate of it um, because he understood that anyone fighting for social justice needed it in order to critique their circumstances. And there you see, you know, the police, you know, we find your speech hurtful. Um, uh, speech does hurt. It's going to hurt somebody. Um, but that can't, again, that can't be the standard that we use for whether we're going to allow it. Um, so uh, that's the case we try to make in the book. We try to look backwards into history. Bob, if you could do the next slide. Um, well, uh, this is your four points. So yes. uh, I don't know if you want to just quickly go over them or do we go to the next slide? I, you know, I, I just wanted the viewers to see them just to get a sense of where okay. we're going, right? These are the basically the four claims that we make, you know, that um, you know, free speech, it allows us to criticize our leaders, it allows racial minorities and um, you know, other minorities challenge their oppression, allows us to consume the art and film that we want, and it allows uh, you know, students and teachers to speak their minds at school. But before we leave this slide, let's remember, and this is why the history piece is so important, that all of these you know, rights have been observed in the breach. I mean, they're violated and neglected and ignored across our history. Uh, that's why we need an awareness of their past, and that's why we need uh, vigilance in protecting them. Um, I have a feeling that you would have been able to know those points without seeing the slide. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, yeah, I probably. Yeah, yeah, you're right about that. Or do you want to go to the actual next slide? Um, I, I, in the, yes, in, in, I, I, um, I, in just a moment. Let's. Sure. Uh, the, the, the first one is about political minorities, right? That is, free speech and language to criticize our government. And I think the important history for people to understand, and I'm sure many people on this call do, is that it's not until the Vietnam War that American citizens had the right to criticize their government during wartime. Um, so, you know, as soon as we're a nation, John Adams and his administration create the Alien and Sedition Act, which essentially make it illegal to criticize John Adams and the American government. We were in a snit with France. They had. I uh, um, occupied a couple of our ships and demanded bribes. And essentially the Adams administration by, with Alexander Hamilton, by the way, this doesn't come through in the musical, just criminalized criticism of them. Uh, and you know, the argument, it's the same argument that censors use across time. Uh, there's a war going on. Um, why should we let anyone play for the other team? Um, and the same thing happens during the Civil War. And now if you could put the next slide, Bob. Sure. Um, Hundreds of people are arrested for criticizing the war in the North, that is, and criticizing Abraham Lincoln. Um, 300 newspapers are closed. Um, uh, you know, uh, people are jailed um, for, say, for criticizing Lincoln and for saying you know, um, things that today we would obviously recognize as horribly racist, like this is a war for the Negro or Lincoln is making the Negro more important than white people. Um, and Lincoln's argument was pretty simple for why these people should be arrested in jail. You know, he said, again, there's a war going on. Um, armies can't be maintained unless desertion shall be punished by death. Must I shoot a simple-minded soldier boy who deserts? And I must not touch a hair of a wily agitator who induces him to desert. Well, Lincoln himself had been an anti-war protester. That is, as a young congressman, he had criticized James Polk and the Mexican War. Um, and lots of people in the North, including supporters of Lincoln, criticize him for this. They point out that you know, this order violates the battle cry of freedom that's at the heart of the Union case. And I think it's important to note that Lincoln himself comes to the same conclusion. Uh, he revoked his order to close the Chicago Times in his home state of Illinois and uh, scolded his generals for closing other papers because he said, how can we fight a war for freedom if we're not allowing it? Um, and that also begins a very rich history that we tell in the book of censors coming to regret their censorship. Um, so, you know, during the First World War, you probably read that Oliver Wendell Holmes wrote an opinion in which he upheld the jailing of, yes, the head of the Socialist Party of Philadelphia, which is where we are tonight, a guy named Charles Schenck, who had distributed pamphlets uh, urging people to resist conscription in the war. 
And it's in that case, of course, where, you know, Holmes makes his famous analogy. He says, freedom of speech does not include falsely shouting fire in a crowded theater. Well, by the next year, Holmes has actually backed off that. Um, uh, a guy named Abrams is, is arrested for distributing pamphlets in Yiddish, criticizing America for invading Russia, which we did during the Bolshevik Revolution. Um, and the majority of the court upholds that, says, no, you can't do that. No, we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know. We can't predict how people are going to react to this. And by this time, Holmes is in dissent. That is, he regrets jailing or upholding jailing of Schenck. And in the Abrams case, he says something that I think is really important, which is that censorship makes a certain kind of awful sense. He says, quote, persecution for the expression of opinion seems perfectly logical. If you have no doubt of your premises or your power and you want a certain result with all your heart, you naturally express your wishes in law and you sweep away all opposition. I think that's right. It's natural and awful way. And that's precisely why we have to resist it. Because um, we've all felt it. We've all felt that urge, that impulse um, to stamp out something that we think is horrible or that we think will have horrible consequences. Um, uh, but we have to resist it. Um, and we have to resist it because as Holmes pointed out, we can't be too sure of ourselves, right? We don't always know that we're right um, or we shouldn't. And most of all, when we start stamping it out, and this gets to the second point about you know, uh, uh, racial and gender minorities, it will be the people at the bottom. It will be the people with the least power who get hurt. So moving to the second point about minorities, um, let's remember that the first mass censorship campaign in the United States happens after Nat Turner's rebellion. Uh, what happens? Um, uh, there are laws passed all over the South blocking anti-slavery literature, um, uh, making it illegal to distribute, sometimes to publish. Um, there are gag rules barring anti-slavery petitions from the floor of Congress. Um, uh, who objects to this most famously and most loudly? Yes, Frederick Douglass. And this will be a theme here, right? Every great tribune of social justice is also a tribune of free speech. He calls it the great moral renovator of society. And his argument is, if we don't have that, we've got nothing. We can't criticize our circumstances. Um, the suffragists, right? Um, uh, we just had the centennial of the amendment, uh, the federal amendment allowing uh, women to vote. Um, well, people like Alice Paul were also great tribunes of, the, of free speech because it was denied to them. Um, they're denied permits for marches. They're brutalized by mobs. Well, you know, cops look the other way. And if we go to the next slide here. Um, and yes, the campaign for birth control. Um, that's Margaret Sanger, of course. Uh, she's indicted in 1914 on four counts of obscenity for publishing information about contraception in her magazine. Uh, she's facing a 45-year jail sentence, so she runs away to the UK. Uh, the charges are dropped. She comes home, and she embarks on a speaking tour, and she's brutalized everywhere. Um, at Town Hall in New York City, the police try to stop her from speaking. The crowd lifts her onto the stage. Um, uh, she said she has the right to speak. She dares the police to club us if they want to. They grab her arms, pull her out of the hall. The crowd breaks into a chorus of my country, tis of thee. Um, uh, she needed free speech. Uh, think about you know, the early gay rights movement. Um, so much of it actually depends on gay publications like bodybuilding magazines, which were popular in the gay community. They're also censored across the United States until the courts actually intervene and allow people to publish and distribute them. And if you wanna understand the, like the flowering of the gay rights movement, that's the place to start. Um, again, with free speech. And again, when we stop defending it, it's minorities who will suffer. So to take a more recent example, you may remember that the University of Michigan uh, passed a speech code in the 80s, basically barring you know, racist and sexist language. Uh, um, uh, behavior, verbal, physical, that stigmatizes an individual on the basis of race, ethnicity, religion, sex, or sexual orientation. Well, over the next 18 months, um, uh, Blacks are charged with violating that in 20 cases. One black student is punished for using the term white trash because somebody says that's racist. Um, obviously that wasn't the intent, I don't think of the people passing this code, but that's, what's hap that's what happened. 
Um, uh, the next point about art, film, and literature, Bob, if you go to the next slide, um, uh, pretty much every author that we've come to venerate was in fact censored. Uh, D.H. Lawrence, James Joyce, uh, William Faulkner, Ernest Hemingway. My favorite quote about this comes from a federal customs inspector because in the early 20th century, those were often the people that were charged with keeping these books out of the United States. And somebody says to him, what's a classic? And he says, quote, a classic is a dirty book that somebody is trying to get by me. Uh, and you know, we tell that story in the chapter and also the story of film censorship, which is less known and in some ways is more ubiquitous. Um, once we get electronic entertainment, there's this fear that especially kids are going to be hurt by it or swayed in the wrong direction. Um, uh, and also like adults who can't read or write, they can still go to the Nickelodeon and there's a huge amount of fear about what this will do. So um, states create these censorship boards that have incredible charges. I just want to, to read the Maryland state film law. Um, uh, this is the early 20th century. It banned, quote, suggestive comedy, stories built on illicit love, overpassionate love scenes, disrespect for the law, men and women living together in adultery, drinking and gambling made attractive, prolonged success to criminals, maternity scenes, and titles calculated to stir up racial hatred and antagonistic relations between labor and capital. In other words, anything that's interesting. Um, uh, and, you know, censors order the removal of scenes showing women breastfeeding. Uh, the review board in Memphis rejected a film set in a racially integrated classroom. Uh, why? That would, quote, offend the sensibilities of the South, um, by which, of course, they meant the white South. Um, and yet, more recently, efforts to censor film and art um, uh, have claimed that it offends not uh, whites, but racial minorities. Uh, so to take a very recent example, you might've read about the mural at George Washington High School in San Francisco, uh, depicting among other things, enslaved black people, slain Native Americans. Um, uh, there was an effort, there has been an ongoing effort to cover it up, to take it down on the same grounds that censors always use, you know, it's gonna harm young people. Um, uh, except in this case, uh, you know, it's racial minorities. Um, there's a sad irony to all this, which is some of the same people demanding that want to rename the school, George Washington High School, after its most distinguished alumna, Maya Angelou, which by the way, I would be fine with. Um, uh, I think that'd be terrific. I think it'd be a great solution, actually. I keep up the mural and rename after Maya Angelou. Uh, the irony here is, of course, why the Cage Bird Sings, uh, her most popular book, is also one of the most censored books in the history of the United States. Uh, because of its depiction of sexual violence and racism and, and, and uh, things like that. So there's a poignant irony there. Um, moving to the, the last point about allowing students and teachers to speak their minds at school. If you can move to the next slide there, Bob. Um, I think most Americans don't know this, but for most of our history, students had no rights in school, no free speech rights. Indeed, the term student rights really dates from the 1960s. And to the larger point of our book, it too comes out of the campaign for racial justice. So in 1964 in uh, uh, segregated Mississippi, um, uh, African-American kids in an all black school start wearing the one man, one vote button of SNCC of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And they're sent home. And then you know other kids at other all black schools start to wear it. They're sent home to, there's a boycott. And eventually a federal circuit court said that they could wear them uh, provi uh, provided that the buttons don't interfere with the decorum of the school. And that actually became the basis of Tinker v. Des Moines of the Mary Beth Tinker armband case. Um, I, I, it's important to note that Mary Beth Tinker's family also came out of the civil rights struggle. Um, her dad was a radical Methodist minister they had been run out of their previous Iowa town because he supported the uh, desegregation of the swimming pool. Um, uh, and I, I, she, she wears this armband to school, she gets sent home. Ultimately, the Supreme Court says, you can wear it and you have a right to speak your mind in schools. Again, provided that um, you don't interfere with somebody else's right to learn that is provided it doesn't, it doesn't uh, cause what the court said was, you know, a material or substantial interference with learning. Um, now, before we go to the discussion, I just wanna make it clear that, you know, 
This is in the eye of the beholder and figuring out what will disturb and what will interfere is hard. Um, uh, you know, should a kid be able to uh, wear a t-shirt to school that has a Confederate flag that shows an aborted fetus? It has a passage from the Bible that the kid says, uh, you know, uh, uh, interdicts homosexuality. Uh, should they be able to wear a t-shirt saying build that wall or make America great again? Um, those are tough calls, but I would argue that even the quest for balance in those cases, the quest to figure out what's going to disturb and what isn't, shows how far we've come. Um, that is that we're even having that debate um, uh, about, you know, what kids should be able to say and what's going to interfere with their learning. Um, uh, most of all, though, I think all of us have to be vigilant about protecting these rights. And if we could go to the, uh, the last slide here, Bob. Um, look, I get it. I get it that there's hate speech. I get it that there are awful actors um, in our country, in our society, that say awful things about other human beings. Um, of course, we should raise our voices against that. I just did, right? Criticizing hate speech is a form of free speech in its own right. But that's different from denying speech to somebody or using the state, the government, to prevent them from speaking. That never ends well. Uh, it turns its targets into martyrs. And most of all, I think it betrays a lack of confidence in us, in our democracy. If we believe in our ability to govern ourselves, we need to let everyone speak their mind. And we have to have faith that that messy cacophony, that American crazy, is going to yield a more just and decent society than any censor can possibly create. Uh, it was Frederick Douglass who said that liberty is meaningless where the right to utter one's thoughts and opinions has ceased to exist. Look, he was a victim of slavery. He knew more about hate and inequity and brutality in America than most other people. But he also knew we could never make anything right if we forsook our right to free speech. We've got to remember the brave women and men who raise their voices for justice at great risk to themselves. And we've got to speak up again for free speech, which remains our best vehicle for righting the wrongs of our society. And to quote the last lines of our book, let free speech ring. Anything less will diminish us all. Thanks. Well, you convinced me. <laughs> I'd rather say that. Now, I guess, I hope this everything doesn't blow up. I figure I'll stop sharing or else we'll keep seeing this fantastic slide of our uh, cartoon actually of, of, uh, uh, of Signe. So I'll stop sharing. Oh, that didn't work. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Oh, that worked. I thought that was it. I thought my, 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 big, my biggest worry is the, the, my wife came home with our dogs. And I think we'd all agree that dogs should not have unencumbered free speech during <laughs> one of these Zoom things. Because it's, you know, it's all the same thing. You know, first of all, I think that was, first of all, the cartoons were fantastic. And I've looked at all the cartoons in the book which are of the same quality. But I think that your, your, your review of the history of it is so important because we're all old enough. I feel that I, make, I made up a term at one time, which is called chronocentrism. You think this is the moment. And, and there's a kind of tunnel vision about a moment in time. You forget about the history, and I'm sure there are a lot of younger people listening to this. This has a very long history of, of freedom in general and what is the essential quality of freedom. You know, I think Lincoln said that, the, you know, against slavery, saying that was, was essentially that there was no right of property in man. No one had, the, that was the ultimate thing. The, the ultimate lack of freedom is someone being enslaved. That's the ultimate lack. And the freedom of speech was used to, to you know, to change that. But I was wondering about both you and Signe think of how the different ways in which speech are being constrained now, not by the state, but by technology companies. I often think the most strong way in which speech is constrained is by commerce itself. 
commerce, money. When you look at at at, at why was there a Hazak? Why why did uh, 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 Desi and Lucy have separate beds? Why did they have all of that? Why that was commerce? The commerce wasn't. It, 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 and when you're at a magazine, you have advertisers. Advertisers have a lot to say about controlling free speech. And what I found when I was working at the New Yorker, the greatest danger is incorporating the, the censorship in your own mind. It's one thing to have someone at an organization say, you can't do that. But what usually happens is you already censor yourself. So you never get to that moment where that uncomfortable moment. So that's, I think, is the danger for, for creatives. And, and the only thing I'd add, I think you're right, Bob, the only thing I'd add is that, you know, we now have a significant poll literature showing that especially at universities, people are doing just what you're describing, that is, they're biting their tongue. Um, so, you know, the Foundation of Individual Rights and Education, which is also based here in Philly, they did a very sophisticated survey of dozens of universities, and they showed that people across the political spectrum are self-censoring, right? There's no law uh, that's preventing them from raising their voices. What's preventing them from raising their voices is fear, and specifically fear of, you know, disapproval and fear of being a pariah. Um, we are social creatures. Um, nobody likes to be on the outs, um, but unfortunately, right, when we do that, when we censor ourselves, what we do is we really do limit our ability to teach each other and ultimately to govern ourselves. Um, for, for us to figure out what we want to do about anything, including about free speech, we need to be able to talk. Um, and I think there's considerable evidence that we're not because we're afraid. Well, you know, to your point earlier is it's natural to suppress free speech. Every organization does it in their cover-ups. Every organization does it when something goes wrong. What happened in New York and Cuomo and all of that. Everybody circles the wagons. If you've been in or if the first impulse when you've made a mistake is to lie and to tell people to shut up. And that's natural. It comes from when you did the bad thing at home and the parents came home and maybe you said, but shut, don't tell mom, okay? You know, we'll lie, this is good. You know, so it, so it is, it, it's not natural to think that everyone should say what they want, not lie, do this. In fact, it's the reverse. And that is the triumph, I think, of the enlightenment and, and all that follows it, you know, which is a huge breakthrough. I, I mean, the only thing I'd add is though, and, and this speaks to your chronocentric point earlier, I do think that there is a generational split here. I can see it with my own students. I can see it with my own daughters who are young adults. Um, they've grown up in a different media environment, but I also think that they've just grown up in a different political environment. And one of the things that's happened, you know, in the past 20 years is something that I've called in my books, the psychologizing of politics which is the framing of political claims in psychological terms. So if I disagree with you, it's not just that I think you're wrong or misguided or misinformed. It's that, that you harm me, you harm me psychologically. That's a different kind of claim and it's much harder to reply to. I mean, I, you know, I, I, when somebody says that, I generally say, I'm sorry. Um, I don't know what else there is to say. Perhaps I could ask the person more about why they felt harm, but I certainly wouldn't deny their harm. I can't, I can't look into their souls, but that's precisely what makes this such a poor venue for politics, for discussion, which does require a kind of denial. Yeah, Sydney, in, in terms of your cartoons, when have you had done a cartoon where you found someone said, not so much, it hurt, I'm sure you've had it where I'm offended, I don't agree with that, but in terms of what John is talking about, the transition from, I don't like it, it's not funny, you shouldn't have said that, to, it upset me. You know what I mean? It, it, it had well, the I, I, on me. Well, the, uh, what has changed for me is that um, in, in the olden days, <laughs> you know, when I was first getting started, I, I think the, the things that, that really upset people were personal in a broader sense. It was usually religion, 
or ethnicity. And um, they're, they're, they're broader than just you upset me. I mean, you yeah. damaged my people. Um, and uh, we saw that certainly in the Danish cartoons. Um, you know, it wasn't just that uh, the cartoonists damaged Mohammed, they, 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 they damaged 100 million Muslims around the uh, around the world, and they were all personally hurt. But what I what I find, and I did a cart. Uh, I've I've been in trouble with pretty much every religion, um, and what I have found out after the cartoons run, um, we get a huge influx of. Um, of uh, uh, protests. Sometimes in the good old days, they would pick it in front of the newspaper. Now nobody knows where the newspaper is, so we don't get any tickets anymore because it's so small. But at any rate, we, um, you know, what we would do is invite people in and, talk, you know, they could tell, tell us why they were upset. They wrote, um, they wrote tons of letters to the editor. And, um, but it wasn't instantaneous. It took a minute for them to get the pickets out, and it took another minute to write letters and another another day or two for us to publish them. So people had a time to think about it a little bit. And then there was always a second wave that came back and would say, well, they had a point with that cartoon. And so I, I have always said that these controversial things aren't where conversations end, it's where they begin. It's a place where we can start to talk about our differences and our, um, and our um, uh, uh, you know, what we hold dear, yeah, you know? <laughs> I, mean, um, I think it's become, I think it, the difficulty is it's become so tribal. In, in other words, everything is, is a marker for it's not about the thing, it's what side are you on in a much broader debate and a much broader constellation of issues that uh, because, because okay, if you believe this, you probably believe this, this, and this, and I don't believe any of those things. So I don't want to give an inch on this because then it might be that. And it's like you say, it's, it's the psychologizing and it's the politicizing of a much bigger sphere than ever existed. And we're also able to not have to depend on our own arguments because there are so many little snippets. People are right there on Twitter giving you, oh yeah, that's good ammunition and that's good and that's good and that's good. And then you have essentially people just trading the, 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 uh, these conversational chits back and forth. And you, well, don't, you don't get to real dialogue. That, you don't get to real dialogue. And I think that is the problem. Well, one of the things I've noticed that is that, you know, now that um, Donald Trump isn't uh, our president anymore, uh, oddly, I don't- really? I, That happened? That's so <laughs> great. It happened. I wish it happened. I, I should have been paying attention. <laughs> yeah, okay. You should have, as usual. <laughs> oh, I can't believe it. I stop bowling all the time. There's <laughs> other things in life besides bowling. Okay, go ahead. So, yeah, oh, you know. thank you, Bob, for letting me get a word in edgewise. <laughs> okay, uh, I'm going to moderate when you when you do a right, book right, okay. next. <laughs> but at any rate, when um, um, okay, now I've forgotten what I'm going to say. You're going to say the codependence on Donald Trump. But the media. oh yeah, 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 yeah. Well, so now he's gone. Well, for the time being, his his all his buddies are around. But you know, we have a different president who, you know, doesn't do everything absolutely perfectly. And so all of a sudden, when I do a cartoon that is even mildly critical of Biden, you can see like if I post something on tr Twitter. You know, all of a sudden the retweets go down to zero, <laughs> and uh, so yeah, we have. Uh, I I had an audience who expected me to hate Trump and everybody around him, and and the whole the whole kabang. And um, if there if there's you know any anything now on the other side, I'm I'm uh, a traitor to the cause. And, so. And um, yeah. That, that's something that's that's a little bit different. 
and, too. And, and let's face it, I mean, one of the consequences of this sort of political cascade that Bob was alluding to in this kind of what I would call guilt by association, where one thing is linked to another, is that free speech itself is now becoming coded as a conservative thing. You know, so Fox News talks about cancel culture. Um, without talking about Republicans who cancel things, but that's, you know, let, let that go for a second. But then it becomes coded as a conservative thing. So I can tell you at my own institution, I know for a fact there are many people that think I'm a conservative because I'm loud about free speech. And, you know, they can think what they want. That It doesn't trouble me that they think that about me, but it does trouble me the political nexus and implications of this trouble me deeply. Right, um, which is that this is getting coded as a right wing thing, and it's just it's hugely a historic. I mean, for all the reasons I was trying to lay out, right? Um, it's been at the heart of left wing politics since John Adams. Well, uh, you'll be happy to conservative ahead, about it. Ahead, you'll be happy to know that the that North T uh, Dakota recently uh, passed a free speech rights bill that eliminates all uh, any free speech zone on any of their college campuses. But the problem was there were none <laughs> in any of their, right. in, in their, so, I mean, it's crazy. I mean, it's not like one side is uh, all cancel culture, both sides. Oh, no, are, definitely are not. Trump did a huge amount of canceling himself. And then you have these Republican state legislatures who were saying you need laws that you, you, you can't talk about critical race theory or the 1619 project. I mean, that's cancel culture too. So trust me, I'm not trying to apologize for them or even defend them. I'm just pointing out the way this has now been quoted. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, especially on campuses, it's being mischaracterized as a conservative impulse. Well, isn't there a problem in coding, in sloganeering, when a phrase starts to substitute for an argument? So you say it's cancel culture or you're on the wrong side of history. And, and therefore, you know, you can't really, uh, that's not a good thing to have being on the wrong side, I'd rather be on the right side. So instead of discussing the things in their specificity, so you can think about them, it, it's, it's a buzzword. It's a, it, it happens in business all the time where it's not malevolent, but it's just like, let's not think, let's drill down, let's, take the low hanging fruit, let's do all these things, except think about that our business is failing. Right, right, and substitute name calling for argument, right? Yeah. And Trump, of course, was a master at that, right? You know, you're a dummy, you're a loser, right? Uh, but then, you know, uh, you know, some of his opponents, like, you're a mansplainer, you know, you're a racist, you're a homophobe, you're a transphobe. Um, and those things too can be used in an incredibly, incredibly facile uh, and, and, and uh, you know, incorrect, in my view, ways, yeah. Well, maybe some people in the audience would like to ask us a question or two. I, I think we should suppress that. <laughs> oh, thank God. I knew I could count on you, Bob. Oh, I, this free speech is fine for <laughs> older people. Uh, you know, just on the cusp of dementia, because <laughs> these are the last coherent things they may end up saying in their lives. You know, you young kids, you're going to have a lot of talking. We could just start drooling or babbling at any point. So, no. All right, we're going to open it up for your Q&A, and I guess I will look at that, and there's 28. Uh, if, okay, I'm reading... Uh, I was a person who asked about the cartoons and uh, uh, says, is number four different from number one? You mentioned students in particular. So number four was the Abraham Lincoln one, your great uh, emancipator. And number one was the Martin Luther King. I'm not sure what the- what Yeah, I, 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 think, I think Eleanor might be referring to like the different arguments, not the different cartoons. I see. And, and you know, I, I think she's right. I think they're related, right? Um, uh, you know, the first argument was it, free speech lets us criticize our leaders, especially during wartime. And, you know, the last one was it allows students and teachers to, um, you know, raise their voices in school. And they're absolutely related. Mary Beth Tinker is a good example of it, right? She was criticizing her national leaders with her symbol. But I think it's important to note, right, that, you know, students and teachers have been censored for all kinds of things, not just criticizing the government, you know, um, criticizing the principal, right? Um, you know, I, um, I, or, you know, I, um, criticizing a sports team or a sports mascot. 
Um, uh, uh, so, you know, I just thought it was important to have like a category about that so people can understand especially how recent the idea of student rights is and also how tenuous. I mean, here's an interesting question. Uh, do you support libel claims by the voting machine companies against Fox News? So here, here we get into the legal part of, of the way the law deals with speech yes. uh, and defamation. And I guess we could ask a broader question. Do you support libel laws? <laughs> Well, look, yeah, I'm not a lawyer. I don't even play one on Ooh, TV. I thought that's like the, um, the climate people's. I'm not a scientist. <laughs> exactly. You're, you're but speak out like yeah, I read about it. I read about it. And, and look, you know, if you're talking about somebody that's already in the public square, mm -hmm. the way the system works in the United States is it's not enough for them to, to say, like, you, you, if you, you wronged me or even you said something that was untrue about me. You also have to show that there was malice, that you did this on purpose. And to me, that makes a lot of sense. Look, we do need libel laws. Um, uh, and I, 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 have not, I have not read enough about you know, uh, the particular case of this questioner to say whether it should apply there, but I think we should be very clear. It shouldn't be, or it can't be enough just to say that Fox said something that was untrue. Um, uh, Fox has said many things that are untrue. Um, well, well, that uh, so have other media companies, by the way. And if that was going to be the barometer, there would be a whole lot of libel. There would be libel every day. Um, I think what you need to show in a case like that isn't just that uh, Fox said things that were incorrect about Dominion. It's that they knew they were incorrect. They knew they were lying. And what they were trying to do was to injure this party with something they knew was false, which by the way, might be what has happened. But to me, that's a reasonable standard. Well, isn't there a shift though? And this brings up an interesting point. And as I guess the case, I don't remember. I'm not a lawyer either. And, and the, the uh, you know, Sullivan versus the New York Times where, 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 where the component of malice was brought in. And I forget where, uh, uh, you know, uh, I believe that people are saying, well, we should look at that again and make it less stringent. It hasn't, doesn't have to be malice but you knew it was untrue. So I think you're right. I still would be on the side of, 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 of letting the media say these things uh, rather than starting a cascade of lawsuits, which would be very chilling if you knew that, if you knew that even that you'd be, because when you look at the practical part of it, if you've got money, and can sue, you've got power to suppress speech even if you don't win. And so I think that's important. Let me look at another question. I think uh, this is... Uh, 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 can, I, can I answer one? Sure, sure. Uh, Mark Morrow asked, did you consider including controversial historical cartoons in your book? And um, no, we didn't because it was about the, the current events. But you re it's really interesting that right now, um, Thomas Nass, the most famous American cartoonist, has been uh, somewhat canceled because um, mm. he late, very late in his career, um, he did cartoons about reconstruction in the South, which included uh, black new black legislators who were acting um, crazy and it, it, to our to the, looking to our eyes it's they're very stereotyped typical uh, depictions uh, he was also against uh, immigration of um, Catholics from southern Europe and uh, Chinese but his greatest <laughs> if you look at the bulk of his his work he was one of the most out um, uh, outspoken critics of slavery and pro the union cause. Abraham Lincoln called him my recruit, my best recruiting sergeant. And um, just two weeks after the Emancipation Proclamation uh, was issued, he did this it, it, double page, absolutely astonishing engraving. Um, endorsing it and um, 
and showing what would happen if if in, enslaved people were made free. They would become regular citizens. I mean, his his work was just phenomenal and beautifully, beautifully crafted. And to, to me, to have that um, that central part of his career, um, uh, you know, it has the Overseas Press Club, which I no longer enter their stuff in my, their contest, ripped his name off the Thomas Nast Award, and it's just now the Cartooning Award. I, I, I just, I, I can't go there. I, I am perfectly happy to say that some of his cartoons were uh, in our in our lives, um, not you know, not up to our standards and understanding now. But um, but they couldn't. The, I mean, yeah, that's the thing. And, they couldn't. And do. and I I mean, I can't wait. I, I I'm I'm debating whether to burn all my cartoons. <laughs> or actually donate them because, you know, some grad student 75 years from now is going to just have a field day. Here's the problem. You have to turn them into NFTs. What's that? <laughs> NFTs, are you kidding? The Beeple thing, you'll be making millions of dollars of these cartoons once you make them into a non-fungible tokens. Oh, OK, great. Thanks. You also give cookies <laughs> with the tokens. But here's the I, thing, if, you, I, if, if we remove Thomas Nast, right? We're also going to remove our understanding of even the racism that's being indicted here. That's the problem. Yeah. Like, did Nast engage in some racist caricaturing? Absolutely. That's a part of Nast and also a part of our visual history, right? It's been marked by racist imagery. Mm -hmm. uh, no serious person can test that. But if we start removing these from public sight, we won't know about that part of our history. Right, I mean, this is the same problem with monuments. I, I don't think Confederate monuments deserve pride of place in the middle of our cities, but I also don't think they should be off in storage or in an undisclosed location, right? Because then we won't know about the history, including the racist history that they embody. But also it's a, going back to, it's a puritanism about humanity that is unfortunately, for the most part, I think inflicts the young because you think the world can be perfect and you think that you've now got it, you know what I mean? And so it's a, it's, it, it, it's a necessity for being absolutely perfect. We don't realize how we're gonna be judged a hundred years from now. Maybe, you know, we'll, people will look at everybody who ate meat, everybody who ate meat and, and will look at it, all of the suffering that you cause because now we have little devices that can measure the suffering of animals and we can see how huge it was. Maybe we won't have to have pets anymore because the pets, you know, it, it could be a million things. You, how the future will look at us, we're imperfect and the country is imperfect and all you can try, you can try to do better in a lot of different ways. And I think free speech does that. Do you see any other quest, good questions uh, that you really wanna get to, Sydney? Uh, oh, how about does UPenn have a speech code? Yeah, Jonathan. They took it away. Um, uh, they did like a lot of other places. Uh, but after the notorious water buffalo incident, which some people might remember, you know, with a student from Israel called the student a water buffalo. And there was a big debate about whether that was a racist statement. He said it wasn't. He said in Hebrew, it refers to just like a loud person. Yeah. That wasn't the way that his targets thought it. But after that, to Penn's credit, they took it away. Um, uh, Joanne Weinberger asks, why is fake news free free speech? And I think this this gets thrown uh, thrown out quite quite a bit. Um, and it, I, I I guess one of the things is how do you know it's fake unless you bring it out into the sunlight and people can say that's fake. I mean, um, it, and I I, I the there's some, you know, I, I read a conservative newspaper sometimes, and I find out things that is that are not in the New York Times, <laughs> or, um, and um, you, you need, you need to at least be able to see them. I think, um, I, I think the problem has been the, um, uh, 
I, again, this separation makes it hard for for people who are only seeing what what you are considering fake news, or I would consider fake news. They're not getting um, seeing daylight either from uh, from another side. So um, it's it's hard. I, I mean, somehow or another, we have to actually speak to each other, <laughs> and and. Um, and share share what we know. But but also the point you're making, Sydney, is okay, a lot of people think these news that you think is fake is not fake. If you suppress that, it's not like the conspiracies go away or their beliefs go away, just like that wonderful cartoon you have. They don't go away. Also, on the free speech, you have the right to knowingly say something that you know to be untrue. You have to accept that as part of the package, because otherwise, how do you police all of it? How do you know? It becomes impossible. And free speech is an imperfect tool because we're imperfect. We can't have perfect tools. We, that's why we can't have nice things because we because we're just how we are. This is part of the mix, how life goes. and. Mm -hmm. The historical background that John gave is amazing because we live in, in our little bubble here in a pretty good time, COVID notwithstanding. We don't understand a lot unless you read history about how bad it can get, how yeah. bad it can get versus tweets you don't like, things said that you don't like. And well, all, for, those, for... all those censors believed, believed in their bones that they were doing the right thing and the necessary thing right? That there was a great, awful fake news thing out there and they had to get rid of it. They had to get rid of it because it was going to have this awful consequence. And they did not trust the rest of us, right? Well, That's what censorship is. It's a lack of trust in the rest of us. In, in, um, in Myanmar, um, the generals have just uh, issued their first command to journalists, stop using the words coup, regime and junta stop it no more <laughs> so that should pretty much uh clear things up for the uh, junta and the regime <laughs> yeah so a lot of interesting i mean questions you know the the, the uh 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 so i have one here bob was there ever a charlie hebdo moment at the new yorker well, I knew the guys at Charlie Hebdo somewhat, and I gave a, a speech at Penn in, in, in defense of them, and they got a reward where half the people at Penn didn't show up, you know, because Charlie Hebdo was so terrible. I think at the New Yorker, they're definitely, and through the New York Times too, when those cartoons first came out, there was this strange thing saying, we're not gonna show them in newspapers because they're not funny, or we can describe them. Ooh, uh, when that wasn't it, what it was was there, I think, which is different than it is now. There, it was what Timothy Garton Ash, I think his name is called, the assassin's veto. People had been killed. It would have cost a lot of money. And there was real fear, real fear that if you were at the New Yorker or the New York Times, you do that, you going out of the building, you know, you're not so sure. Now would be more the social context of what if you, you know, if you did that, because clearly a lot of the cartoons were completely obnoxious to a lot of people and stuff. And so there definitely was that, and there was what self-censorship. So in, at, at all of the major publications, there's self-censorship because you know what the, whoever the person is on top, they're the person controlling, you know what their attitude is, you know what their views are. And this could be not for really important issues. This could be about being gluten free. And we don't want to upset our gluten. Or, you, or it's just because we're afraid of a group of people. And frankly, we don't think very highly of them. I mean, to me, right. that's what the Dutch cartoon and the Charlie Hebdo thing are at the end of the day, right? There are people who say they're protecting Muslims who have a very low view of Muslims. That's the way I read it. Yeah. Right. It's like these people, you know, they take this stuff really seriously and they're crazy, you know, yeah. like they're not like you and me, you know, they do awful things. But of course, I'm their great protector. Um, what could be more bigoted than to say about a group of people that they can't control themselves in the presence of your image? 
Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I think all of that is to any group is patronizing, whether it's a racial group or a religious group or ever it's somehow, you know, not. Uh, and truthfully, in any group of people, any large group of people, they're going to be people who spout nonsense, we might even be among them. So that's the thing. I mean, that's the likelihood. Thing. Yeah. I don't know. We're, I guess we're coming up. No, we got four minutes. We got four minutes. Why don't we scan this list for something really good? What, can you see it also, John? Here, yeah. let me open it up. Yeah. Oh, um, is it okay if we take a question from Jeffrey Zimmerman? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, 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 among other things, he's my brother. Okay. Why, uh, you're, you're, it's, it says, America's relatively absolute view of free speech is pretty unique, even among developing countries. Has Germany's practice, which wouldn't fly here, of banning anti-Semitic language and symbols been successful in changing attitudes? And if so, is our absolute view of free speech preventing us from similar success in overcoming our racist past? Um, my source on this is, maybe she's even listening, a former colleague and a dear friend, Cynthia Miller Idris, who studies uh, um, the far right in Germany. And what Cynthia has argued in a set of brilliant books is actually banning Nazi symbols inspired the rise of neo-Nazism in Germany. It wasn't the only factor and the right, only reason, um, but it did not do what they imagined. Uh, it had the opposite effect. And we've seen all sorts of instances of that in our own history as well. You know, um, uh, when you censor somebody, you allow them to play the victim. Um, and that's a powerful political position. And it's also a great recruiting tool, right? Look at what this corrupt state is doing. This corrupt state is muzzling people like you and me. Um, uh, it doesn't represent us. It is obviously illegitimate. Um, and also there must be something quite powerful in what we're saying if the state is going through all this sound and fury to try to suppress it. But I would go further and say, you know, the general argument here, and I agree with it, overall it's utilitarian. It works out better. But I think there's something more fundamental. It's an existential right. So, you know, it's like the right to eat what you want. Okay, maybe it would be better if we really control that. You didn't really have freedom of eating, you know, because after all, you eat the wrong things. It could be climate change. It could be your own health. It could be like wearing a motorcycle helmet. But at a certain point, it's what it means to be free is sometimes things don't work out because of what you said. Sometimes they create a worse outcome. Even if they did, this is why, you know, I mean, it's interesting in the Declaration of Independence that we, we hold these, these inalienable rights. As you point out, they're easily alienable. <laughs> it's so easy, you wouldn't believe it. So that's why we have to protect it as part of just what it means to be free. I think Salman Rushdie made this point uh, 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 in, in the book that was banned, it's more than whether it goes good or bad. There's something about it that means to be free, which means to be able to have free speech. Right, and, and I think, you know, uh, John Dewey said that democracy isn't just a system of government, it's also a system of faith, right? It's a kind of religion, it's a kind of secular religion. And to yeah, me- You get the chance to, well, there's one more question, Signe, pick a good one and answer it. Uh, 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 oh. I thought you guys were. Uh, maybe, maybe. So, well, I get, it goes back again. So free speech includes the freedom to lie, even if the lie can cause harm, even violence and death. Um, so I, I don't know which lie he's uh, referring to. Um, the 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 car, the cartoons the like the Danish cartoons led to violence and death, but that was ginned up by um, uh, uh, some Muslim adherents far far away from Denmark, where um, there was an actual discussion going on about um, what about relations with the Muslim minority minority living there. And um, so, I mean, even that one of the clerics who was leading that. <laughs> we may actually be talking to ourselves now. Okay. And, <laughs> All right. <laughs> which is great. Hey, if anybody is still there, I'm really sorry we went over the time. Okay. Uh, you can't hear me, but it was great having you here. Those were lovely questions. Anyway, I, 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 I hope I 
from author events to all participants. Thanks, everyone. Once you all sign out, okay, thanks, everyone. So that's it. So I don't know how we gracefully slip out of this. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but uh, well, look, we'll see you here this time tomorrow night. Yeah, everything. For all the people yeah, that we okay, didn't you, answer you, your the questions. Audience is great, but honestly, I think we really were even a little bit better than the audience. Yeah. <laughs> But I, I'm really, this was great. I hope, hey, Sigley down in, in Philly and, uh, you know, I think you got your shot or something and everything and I'm ready to ramble. I'm double vaccinated. I'm going to come down. I'm going to do a class in the fall with the that would be great. Come that would down really and, and Bob, thank you so much for doing this. Yeah. And thanks to all the really participants. Great. I saw a couple hundred yeah. people and uh, I think uh, hopefully that shows that the concern that or evincing in the book is a widely shared one and one that we're going to rally around. No, I think the book so, is, I think your talk yeah. really made me yeah. think more about it and especially going back, you know, looking at the history, not getting totally torn up in, you know, what what the back and for the bad mitten of the moment. And uh, yeah. I, I, you know, I thought it was uh, great. I'm sorry I talked too much. I always do sit No, we love it. It was terrific. We should, but, we but, but, but I get excited. And yes, I, um, I get excited, you know, not like a Quaker, you know, I can't be like, you know. Thank you. All right. <laughs> we should sign off. Thanks again. All right. Bye-bye. Thanks, bye. everybody. Okay. See you later.